Hello everyone, welcome to Cicerone Live. Um, I'm Amy Hodkin and thank you so much for joining us this evening. This event is all about uh, bivying in the UK and we're joined tonight by Ronald Turnbull, who is a hill walking expert and bivying enthusiast who has written several guidebooks for Cicerone, which includes a brand new edition of his book, The Book of the Bivy. Um, and we're gonna tell you how you can get a discount for that um, in a, just a moment. Um, the book is a bit different to the standard Cicero and guidebooks, as rather than offering lots of routes and maps, um, this focuses on general advice and anecdotes and covers the history of bivying, um, as well as offering a few routes that Ronald has done. Um, it's a really great comprehensive introduction and exploration of bivying that gives you everything you need um, to get started and to get inspired. Um, so it's great for that. But it's also brilliant if you just fancy reading all about Ronald's experiences out on the hills. Um, and last month, Ronald actually completed his 100th hilltop bivy with a night on Walla Crag. And I'm sure he's going to tell us more about that experience in just a bit. Um, the way that the event is going to run. So Ronald's going to start off with a short presentation about bivying. Um, and then I'll ask some questions to him. And then we're going to follow up with questions from you, the audience. So you can write those in the comments on Facebook or YouTube or email them to us um, at live at cicerone.co.uk. So whatever way you choose to do that, um, we'll get your questions and then I'll put them to Ronald. Um, so whatever you want to know, just let us know and we'll, we'll ask it to, to Ronald. Um, for a discount on Ronald's The Book of the Bivy, um, if you go onto the Cicerone website and get that book, put it in, the, in your basket, go to the checkout, and type in the discount code BIVY25. Um, you can get a 25% discount on the print guidebook. Um, and I think our ebooks are currently on 25% off anyway um, as a general sale. So yeah, you can get 25% off the book of the BIVY, um, whichever way you want to do it. And we'll have a, there's a banner that will be coming up along the bottom uh, throughout the event with that disco discount code on. Um, so that's BIVY25. Um, if you're feeling inspired and would like to read the book. Um, so yeah, I'm going to welcome Ronald now. And um, there we go. Hi, Ronald. Hello. Hello. Good. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. I can't really think why you put a 25% discount on it because it's really cheap anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, they, before you were looking at this screen, you were seeing a little kind of introductory text that someone at Cicerone wrote across this brown screen in the background and they described it as they described living as a whole new level of immersion in the outdoors i thought that was a very carefully chosen phrase by someone at cicerone if not sardonic the immersion in the outdoors i would like to say that i have woken up in two inches of water in a tent as well as a heavy bag right i'm gonna um I'm going to move in with a little bit of history explaining how I got into this peculiar pursuit. Um, when I was about 40, I took up fell running, which is the same thing as hill running if you're in Scotland. Um, I was quite a slow hill runner. Um, anything shorter than the Ben Nevis race was too short for me and I was trailing at the back. But once I got used to this wonderful way of moving at high speed across the hills with hardly any clothes on, I wanted to adapt that to my other enthusiasm, which was multi-day trips across the hills of Scotland and northern England, often coast to coast ones. And so naturally, I wanted to get my luggage down to as close to nothing at all as I possibly could. Uh, so that was why I got my first bivy bag. That was and that did allow me to move a typical trip in that part of my life was the Wainwright coast to coast in four days. Um, you're going to have to believe me when I say that doing the Wainwright coast to coast in four days is actually an enjoyable experience. It's a different experience, but it, it is pleasurable in its own way. And the second day into that, I was heading across the Westmoreland limestone moorland. Um, it was drizzling and there was a cold, brisk wind and it was getting dark. So I dodged into a wood to get some shelter um, and what I didn't realize was that the lovely soft moss that I was unrolling my bivy bag onto it was only when I was inside it with my boots on that I realized that under the lovely soft moss there was some not very lovely 
hard, sharp-edged limestone boulders. I didn't carry a sleeping mat because that spoils your aerodynamics. Um, so the only reason I had a sleep that night was because I had covered enough miles that I could have slept anywhere. So that's one end of the bivy bag experience. Uh, but the following night, I passed through Grasmere. I had a nice bar meal, headed up onto Gibson Notch at the back of Helm Crag. It was lovely grassy dip on the ridge high up there, and I was looking down over the top of Helm Crag, down to Grasmere as the sun was going down, and it was kind of warm and soft grass and lovely, and it was just a beautiful night out. So that's the two extremes of bivy bagging. But um, in the time since then, I've got older, I've got slower, I've got softer and more comfort loving. Um, possibly I've even got wiser. So the new edition of the book of the bivy has quite a lot more emphasis on the comfortable side of bivying. Uh, and it also has a whole lot more pictures. Uh, the one thing that remains the same is the price at just under 10 quid. I'm very impressed. Um, so now I'm going to show you the extremes of the bibbing experience. I'm going to immerse you in the outdoors, possibly with a roof on and not out in the rain, and try and show you the two extremes of bibbing. This first picture is to show you that it wasn't my idea, this slightly odd idea of sleeping outdoors in a bag. Uh, this is Robert Louis Stevenson in 1878 uh, on his trip through the Sevens with the donkey called Modestine. He invented his own bivy bag. It's made of sheepskin and tarpaulin. And his problem on that trip was not a lack of comfort at night. Whether it was raining or not, he had wonderfully comfortable nights and some of the best cigarettes of his life. Uh, a minor inconvenience was the revolver in the sleeping bag with him, which was uncomfortable against his toes. Rather a big bivy bag, but of course the donkey was responsible for that side of it. Um, now, will I go on? Will this go on if I... Uh, yep, sorry. <laughs> I run on this shit. Should move on. Go on, move on. Oh, there we are. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that was the exciting bit. Right now, this is a this is a a coast to coast trip across Scotland. Uh, the second night out, I was actually planning to spend this night in the bunkhouse at Glenfinnan, but the weather was so beautiful, and I was going. I was ahead of myself because long days, early starts, late finishes, beautiful weather. So I carried on up onto this mountain, which is Skern and Coryachan above Glenfinnan. Um, you'll see that there's a nice little dip running across the summit of the mountain there, just the right size for a grave or alternatively for lying down in, in your bivy bag um, so that the wind goes over the top of it. And it was also angled in just right for me to be watching the Isle of Rum under the sunset. And of course, when you're in a bivy bag, you don't miss any of it. There's no zip to zip out the scenery with. This is the Isle of Rum below the sunset at seven o'clock in the evening. That's the Isle of Rum below the sunset at nine o'clock in the evening. And that's the Isle of Rum at 10 o'clock in the evening. And this gives you, the, this is what makes the difference with the bivy bag is that you don't zip the outdoors away and snuggle down with your book or your iPad or whatever you happen to have up there. You're out there all night, unless it rains when there's a zip. And this is the following morning when the cloud was seeping up from the valleys. Um, well, you can see that it's a very nice morning. Uh, amazing. And I didn't miss any of it again because of having my head out in the open air. One thing you will notice is that I'm looking quite stout. And that's because I'm wearing every garment that I've got. And I'm also even wearing my waterproof trousers for extra warmth because mornings at 3,000 feet in the Scottish Highlands. Oh, jolly cold. This was the month of May. Um, but once I got moving, uh, I warmed up quickly enough. And as you will realise, that time of day with that cloud, within 10 minutes of setting off, I had to stop to photograph the Brook Inspector. Now, this is an instructional photo. Let nobody say I am merely entertainment. This is instruction. This is a bivouac on the summit ridge of Stobgower, which is just south of 
Glencoe. Uh, Stobgar is the peak of the goats. Um, and again, you can see this beautiful mist. This is a misty evening with clouds swirling around below me. Um, you see my socks drying out in the foreground there. Um, um, but halfway through the night, that cloud came up onto the hill and I found myself sleeping in, again, drizzle, flying sideways and very cold. So at that point, everything that you see lying around there was already in the rucksack by that time. I simply had to put my feet into my boots and I dragged the whole setup round into the shelter of one of those convenient granite boulders. Uh, that is one of the advantages of a bivy bag. You can move it if you need to. And in fact, before going to sleep, I would have worked out where I was going to head for if the weather did turn nasty. Oh, sorry, I've gone backwards. I'm going to cheat. That's here. all right. <laughs> I'm going to cheat here. I should. All right. Yeah. Just press the button. Brilliant. Right. Um, now, this one is on Carnangower in Athol which means the stony hill of the goat. And it is purely coincidence and no way Freudian slip that both the hills I've mentioned so far have been named after goats. Uh, there's no special significance in that at all. This is another of these dubious nights. I was I dried out nicely along the ridge, but when I got to the summit, again, the rain came in flying sideways and very cold. It's a stony summit, so I thought that I was gonna to have to head down off the ridge. But just below the summit, I saw this little ledge. I think it's a landslip effect where the whole hillside has slipped slightly down to the right. This beautiful little ledge just a metre down below the summit ridge. But that was low enough so that the rain and wind were mostly coming above my head. I think the top of my head was up in the rain and the wind there. And there you see I'm sitting with my back to the wind in the in my waterproof jacket with a hood up. I can also when I want to, I can pull up the bivy bag because it has a zip across that sort of cuts your throat level, which means I can put it over my head and it droops down like that. And I have a whole square foot of space on my lap, which is dry to eat my supper in. I'm, I'm not doing that in the picture because it would make a very dull picture. And also I only get 10 seconds on the remote timer. And now this is the following morning when the cloud cleared. A beautiful sunrise, probably at about five o'clock in the morning, I think. This was the month of April. Um, you'll see that I'm still wearing my waterproof, and this isn't to keep the rain out at this point. It's just for the extra warmth of wearing everything that I have in my rucksack. If you look on the rucksack cover on the right there, you'll see that there has frost that's formed on the rucksack overnight. Um, so it was a bit chilly by morning. On the other hand, what I was looking at, oh dear, it's done that again. What I was looking at, suspense, suspense, while you wait to see what I was looking at, is, come on, come on, screen. Now that's the next morning. Uh, that is what I was looking at as I was sitting there, rather chilly in that bivy bag, um, with my waterproof jacket on, although it wasn't raining. Oh dear, this worked when we tried it out, but it's really not happy this, this time. It's a beautiful view though, Ronald. Yeah, you, you can look in for a moment. <laughs> Put your <laughs> questions onto the chat while I'm <laughs> scrolling down and giving you unintended previews of all my slides. Um, yeah, and 10 minutes after getting up, this is me getting nicely warm again, heading down the ridge of Stobgar towards the river tilt. I think the down, okay, this is another instructional one. Um, this is uh, uh, Kanangawi, which means the hill of the winds in the Cairngorms on the Great Moss. Um, that's my son, who I had persuaded to come up onto the hilltop to bivouac with me because he'd been reading my book, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, you can see there's a very wide, shallow dip there, which we'd got down into and which kept out some of the wind. Uh, unfortunately, not enough of the wind. The dip is just too wide and shallow and the wind's just dipping down into it and up again. So we had a rather chilly night up there. 
But again, what a wonderful view to be looking at here with the River Spey and its valley. This, by contrast, is a near perfect bivy site. This is Sheffield Pike above Ullswater. Uh, you can see there's a very deep uh, dip that I've got down into. It's deep enough so that the wind's going straight over the top, but there's just a little eddy coming down into the dip, which gives me enough breeze. I like to feel the breeze across my face in the night. And it also helps with the breathable membrane of the bivy bag. It helps keep everything nice and dry. Also, because it's so sheltered, it's the grass is really juicy and comfortable to lie down on. But the real perfect aspect of it is the way that it's angled right up Ullswater so that you get the sunrise reflected all the way along the lake in the morning. Now, there are several of these little grooves. I think they're meltwater channels from the end of the Ice Age across the top of Sheffield Pike. So you needn't worry that there might be some other listeners to this presentation occupying the groove when you hurry up there with your bivy bag next week because there's several grooves to choose among. Um, now, I did get myself, after a long time spending in a sort of minimal um, polyester sleeping bag designed for mountain marathons and weighing almost nothing and being about as useful as you'd expect, I did get myself a three-season downfield sleeping bag. And this is me sleeping out on a low hill on the middle of Rannoch Moor in December. As you can see, there's a very hard frost. I sort of dodged down into a little peat hollow, which I'd identified on my way up to the summit, and that kept off the wind, um, and it kept off some of the cold because it obscured quite a lot of the night sky. But even so, I was lying there with my, when I opened my eyes, I could see the frost forming on the grass stems in front of my nose, and as the night went on, the frost got deeper, and I brought my boots and my water bottle into the bivy bag with me so they wouldn't freeze in the morning. And the bit which was kind of suspenseful was when I got up in the morning trying to get my jacket zipped up and my boots on and laced before my fingers went numb with the cold and I couldn't use them anymore. I had a sort of vision that I would fail to get my boots on and I would have to stay there until the spring when it warmed up enough to get my boots on. Anyway, I did. And you can see, obviously, the reward for this austere opening to the day was these amazing views across Rannoch Moor with the morning mist and the colours which my camera hasn't done as well as my memory has and that's Shihali and that lovely pointy mountain on the other side of the moor there. Right, this by contrast is an unpleasant <laughs> night out in the bivy bag. There have been one or two. Uh, we were going to bivy down in the Trossachs Oakwoods but it was a beautiful starry night, so we headed up onto Ben Lady anyway in the dark, in the moonlight, with the lights of Scotland's central belt shining across below us on the south side and casting a weird orange glow over the mountainside and combining with the moonlight on the mountains to the north. Very weird, wonderful sculpture effect. And we bedded down in this dip, which you can see in the, at the very near the summit, right beside the trig point of Ben Lady. Um, in the night, I sort of woke up and shone my feeble torch around. I could tell it was the cloud had come down because it got so much warmer. But the ground looked kind of grey and strange. I thought it was the moonlight shining through the cloud. It wasn't. It was an inch of fresh, wet snow which had fallen on us in the night. So that was quite a harsh awakening, especially for my companion who had a state-of-the-art of 20 years ago Pertex bivy bag which was superbly light, superbly breathable but alas was not superbly waterproof. So we stuffed all this wet cold gear into our rucksacks and just set off around the hills straight away. I mean looking back at it from 15 years later it was a fun night out but actually it wasn't. Uh, this, on the other hand, was a fun night out. This is Scorfell Pike. Um, I wasn't sure if I'd get a place to bivy because Scorfell Pike is all Stonefield, as most people who've been there will know. Um, but in fact, I found this beautiful little grassy ledge. It's about a minute away from the summit of Scorfell Pike. In fact, you can work out where it is from the picture. Um, perfect site, beautiful looking out at um, Sellafield, whatever they call it nowadays glowing on the horizon as if it was already radioactive. <laughs> it's in the picture there just beyond Wasquarter. 
The only disadvantage was that I was actually too close to the summit for when the um, the three peak people arrive at four o'clock in the morning, because of course they're very excited to have arrived on Scorfell Pike at four o'clock in the morning, and they have to express their excitement in a way that woke me up slightly earlier than I wanted to be woken up. Uh, but it meant that I didn't miss this fine sunrise. Um, this was a near another near perfect bivy on the summit of Snowdon. It was one of the hottest nights of a very hot summer, so it's very warm and comfortable. This is just 10 or 20 metres down from the summit of Snowdon in the direction towards Lewith. Um, as you can see, there was a, a cloud sea again, um, a sort of bright orange sunrise. Um, and you know the joke about the um, what's yellow with black triangles and very dangerous. It's a good one for your grandchildren. And the answer is shark infested custard. And that was what the view from Snowden was with Crib Goch sticking up in a little black triangle out of this custard sea of yellow orange cloud. Um, yep. And this is, a, this is a technical sort of one, but you see you can have a very comfortable, nice night in a cosy wood if you don't mind missing out on the view. But this is a sort of showing you the technique, rather. Um, I tend, to, there's the hood part of the bivy bag with a zip across at, at the chin level, but I tend to sleep on top of the hood with some stuff in the hood. For I tend to put my waterproof jacket in the hood because it's a good place to find it and it has a certain efficiency as a pillow. But it, the whole point of a bivy bag is to sleep with your head out in the open. And that's also very good in terms of not getting condensation inside the bivy bag because your breath doesn't condense inside the bivy bag. But the main thing is you just have to open one eye to see the stars whirling around the pole star as the night goes on or the stag standing silhouetted against the loch so far below or the lights of Keswick making kind of poached egg effects through the mist that's drifting across down there by the lake. And then if it does rain, you know, obviously I put my head inside the hood and I zip it up. Uh, waterproof cover goes on the rucksack to keep the dew off. And it also means it's easy to stuff the boots in there if it should start to rain in the night. Boots pointing downhill so the rain doesn't get in, but they can ventilate a bit. And the real subtlety, although not really needed on this particular evening, the water bottle upside down so that if it freezes in the night, the ice is in the bottom of the bottle and you can still get a drink out of the top when you turn it the other way up again. Very useful tip, that one. It'd make you look very professional if you do that in your baby bag. And this is, yeah, this is my 100th Bivy Bag Summit at the beginning of May. Um, obviously, I needed to get this 100th one slept on for promotional purposes before this book got published. Uh, the beginning of May was unseasonably chilly. I was intending to spend it on Scorfell, which is the finest summit I haven't slept on yet. Uh, but I downgraded. The thing about Bivying is to be adaptable. So I moved down to Walla Crag. Uh, which is one of the lowest of the Wainwrights, just above Derwent Water there. And even so, the snow came in in the night, but what a magic morning that is. Um, however, us photographers and outdoor writers, we do tend to sometimes fudge things a little. And I have to admit that at the point when the snow was actually falling, I dodged back to the other side of the summit. If you know what a crag, it has some very cosy heather and larch trees just the other side of the summit from here. So I did do that and then I came back again to enjoy the early morning light. It didn't take long to warm up. The sun was rising behind Blencathra. And that's almost my final picture apart from this one. I was, um, I was um, hiking, trekking hut to hut through the Tatras mountains of Slo Slovakia. I came across this astonishing picture pinned to a wall. Uh, I took a photograph of it. I thought I must have this picture for the next edition of the book of the bivy. It's irresistible. It encapsulates everything that it's all about. And I submitted it last year to Cicerone and uh, somebody at Cicerone decided it wasn't exactly the picture that they wanted, either for the cover or even for the inside of their book. So you have to enjoy this picture now because you'll not be seeing it in the book, I'm afraid, when it comes out. Um, and now it's up to Amy how long she's going to let you watch the picture because that's <laughs> the last one in my presentation. I did have to show this picture to Amy in advance so that she'd know she wasn't being Zoom bombed when it came <laughs> on the screen. 
Uh, I think it's brilliant. Thank you, Ronald. Um, and yeah, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, my first question, actually, and it isn't where I was going to start, but you've taken so many brilliant photos and kind of vivid in so many amazing places. As you're out kind of hill walking, are you taking note of all these different places that you could go and stay? Is that something that you do? No, I sometimes do, but mostly I just, I mean, like with Scorfell Pike, I, I went up there. I thought I probably wouldn't be able to get a bivy on the summit, but it was just fun to look around and find one. I generally allow at least 20 minutes for finding a bivy site because it's worth spending that time finding somewhere that's sheltered and has the view and has soft ground underneath and isn't damp. Uh, it just makes the difference between a, an ordinary or nasty night and a really lovely one. But no, I don't. I don't tend to recce in advance. It's more fun to wing it. You can always head downhill. You know, you can switch your torch on and head downhill if it turns out too nasty. So, do you always take your bivy bag with you then? Uh, if it looks like a no, clear night, I, and... I need to take a sleeping bag as well. I mean, I take my bivy bag because it's my emergency shelter and because I'm fond of it, and I don't want to take some horrid plast hunk of plastic instead. Um, but no, it's it's usually planned. Because I'd have to take a sleeping bag as well, and I don't want to don't want to drag a sleeping bag around the hills with me. That's a very good point, actually. Um, I guess if we talk about safety then um, in the hills, and I know you've busied <laughs> in so many different types of weather as you showed us, um, and you're you know evidently very experienced. But for people who are maybe starting out or haven't done that many, um, are there certain times of year or certain weathers that you really should avoid when you're going bivying? Um, yeah, when I'm going off on a trip to the mountains, my wife used to say, stay safe, Ronald. And I'd say, don't stay, say, stay safe. That's not what it's about. Say, have fun, Ronald. <laughs> um, so I'm the last person to talk about safety because I have a quite an irresponsible attitude to safety. Um, I mean, I bivy or I have bivied all the year round. These days I, I'm, I'm soft, so I tend to look at the weather forecast first. Um, I mean, a bivy bag is a great survival aid. You can survive in a bivy bag in a blizzard, even without uh, a sleeping bag. I and mean, it's not nice, but you'll survive. Um, yeah, I, I suppose, think... as, you've, as you've said, though, you know, you should be prepared to drop down if the weather does change or, you know, be adaptable with your plans. I mean, it's much easier to shove a bivy bag into the rucksack in the middle of the night and head downhill, um, provided you've got a torch. You don't have to abandon it like you have with a tent, which might discourage you from heading downhill. I mean, for a beginner, you it's it's you look at the the weather forecast, and uh, you choose a nice pub in the Lake District, and you have a bar meal, and you head up the hill. Um, choose a small hill with nice heather and or you know comfortable grass. Go Barrowfell. It's a bit too far from the pub. Go Barrowfell. No, it's not. No, Go Barrow is good. Um, yeah, Low Fell. From the Kirk style in, that makes a great combination. No fell, except it's very steep. You're going up this really steep hill in the dark, <laughs> which is fun. Um, but you know, if you've got a good weather forecast and a decent sleeping bag and a nice bar meal inside you, really, you're almost guaranteed to have a nice time. Well, I mean, provided you've got a certain amount of irresponsible adventurousness in your temperament, I guess. And another thing I want to ask you about, which you haven't talked about in your presentation, but it's in the book, um, talking about bivying in caves. Now, you said that, you know, it can be quite an uncomfortable um, experience just being on, you know, hard rock um, with kind of moss over the top. But how do you go about bivying in a cave and making that a comfortable experience? Um, oh, well, you take a good sleepy mat for a cave because you're sleeping on stones. Um the essential thing with a cave is to allow yourself enough time to find the thing. I mean, it's quite an exciting moment when you're looking for the dove's hole way up on the top of Dove Crag there, especially if it's a nasty night. Um, uh, you know, you sort of set out across the crags on a little ledge and you think, no, this can't be it. This is beginning to feel very dodgy and you come back and you know that if you don't find the cave, you're going to be sleeping out on a rather steep, uncomfortable hillside in the pouring rain. Um, yeah, so, you know, bear in mind that you have to find the cave and that you might not, so that's one consideration. Uh, a good sleeping mat is really crucial for a cave, uh, something that you blow air into. Um, 
I wouldn't recommend artificial caves. I wouldn't recommend quarry caves. I have slept in a couple, but there's a thing that quarry caves are quite unstable. And if you have a damp, warm person in them overnight, little bits tend to drop off the ceiling. And in the middle of the night, you hear and you wonder if the next of those noises is going to be on you in your bivy bag. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the cathedral cave in, in, uh, in Little Langdale is an amazing place. Uh, the National Trust, I think, has signs upside strictly forbidding you to spend the night in it. So far be it from me to suggest that any otherwise. <laughs> um, and there aren't any photographs in the book of the interior of the cathedral cave in the night. Yeah, I've only spent three or four nights in caves compared to nights out of caves. Yeah, I suppose you're more likely to get a really nice view, aren't you? Um, on either a hilltop or just below the summit. Um, yeah, at or near a hilltop. Or of course, the top of a sea cliff is really great. Um, I mean, caves are atmospheric. They're wonderful places to spend the night, especially in winter. Um, I mean, if you're doing a long day in winter, so you're actually sort of arriving at the cave in the dark, that's fun, trying to find Millican Dalton's cave in the dark when you don't know where the path is. Um, yeah, there's something about ar arriving in a cave in the dark in winter and finding it and spending a comfortable, cosy night in it when it's raining and then leaving it maybe before it gets light in the morning. It's, it's, a, it's a whole different world. It's so different from you know, parking in a car park and walking up the hill and coming back to your car again. But and speaking of different experiences, um, you have done long distance bivvying, kind of going cross country across Scotland um, and bivvying that rather than kind of camping it and taking a tent. Um, so I want to ask you how that experience is, is different doing a long distance bivvy. Um, well, even when I was in that picture that I showed you at the beginning of a long distance bivy, when I was, my hair was still as that sort of muddy brown color instead of this tasteful silvery gray. Um, I would plan the route so that I wouldn't, you know, if I got really wet one night, I could divert to a bossy or a hotel or a youth hostel for the following night. So that there was always, you know, the, that route I planned, the weather was amazing. And I had five successive nights on the summits and bivy bag. Um, but if if it hadn't been, you know, I would have spent at most one night and then dodged down to the bunkhouse or to a nearby bossy. I mean, when I was a fell runner, I just took what came and, um, you know, spent some really quite austere nights out <laughs> in the rain. Um, but when I got a little bit older and softer, I would plan it so that I could escape somewhere. Obviously, you know, obviously if it's nasty weather, you're not going to be on the top of the hill. You're going to be down in a cozy wood or somewhere like that, or even a cave if you can find one. And I suppose it means that, you know, you can carry just less equipment. Can you? Does it uh, yeah, weigh less? Also, also with, with bivvying, I don't carry a cooker. It's just so much fuss fiddling around in the cold air with the cooker that it's better to have a cold meal and then have a really nice bar meal in a day or two or whenever you get down to the bottom and eat lots of vegetables then. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it is lighter and that's good, but it's mainly for the experience. I just love being out there in the open air. I think that a tent is kind of indoors. You know, you get in there, you snuggle down, you pull down the zip and, and where's the outside world? You might as well be in a youth hostel or a, a bothy or at home in bed. Yeah, I've got a lovely quote from your book written down um, that buying a bivvy bag is buying a new way of having fun. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's also a new way of having misery, but <laughs> there's much more fun than misery. Um, and by being a bit careful, you can, you know, only have enough misery to make it interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I and if, and if really, the weather is terrible, really you know, you cannot night. not to do it. Can't you? I had a really nasty night a few years ago. You think I was old enough to know better? <laughs> it's in the, it's in the Cicerone's Fifty Years of Adventure. I put it in there. Um, a snowy night out in Upper Eskdale, which is a magic place. Um, I thought I could get down from Mickledore in the last of the light, and I was sliding down the hill in the soft snow like a yeti in a hurry. And I got below the snow line, but. Um, then during the night, the snow line came down, and so I was no longer below the snow line. And the nice little place I'd found under a boulder 
as my body he thought it out it turned out to be a little bog so yeah i had a really unpleasant night but <laughs> you don't i mean you know you don't have to be all that clever to avoid exposing yourself to that kind of thing. <laughs> that's amazing um, and just before we move to questions from the audience, which we've got loads of, um, and I'm really excited to hear your answers to them. Um, with buying a bivy bag, it's not necessarily like a cheap alternative to a tent, is it? Um, and I wondered if you had any tips on, you know, kind of costs and that sort of thing. Uh, well, I really don't because I'm not a gear person. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the bivy bag I have was considered... Oh, my first bivy bag was hand sewn by a man in a shed in, in the 1990s because that was the only way you could get a bivy bag in those days. And it was just a green nylon bag proofed with polyurethane. And then I moved up to a luxury and it was called it was called the entry level bivy bag. And that was the one that the mouse found in the loft but I patched it up with spinnaker tape, um, which was in one of the pictures there. And I've been using it for... I mean, I still think of it as my new bivy bag, but it's 15 years old. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is cheaper. I mean, that's not the point. But it, you know, you, nowadays, you can get a really good bivy bag, nice and simple and lightweight for £50 from Alpkit or Rab or, uh, yeah, someone else does them as well. Um, what happened was, I mean, it was just me and Robert Louis Stevenson and a few more weirdos, but then the mountaineers started using bivy bags because they needed it at the bottom of the walker spur of the Grand Jorasse. Um, so people like Alpkit started making them for the mountaineers and the mountaineers didn't want internal poles and pockets and zips mm -hmm. and something where weighing almost as much as a tent. They wanted the same as I did, which was something that weighed well under a kilogram and had one zip at most and no pegs or poles or anything uh, so suddenly you know people started manufacturing them and they and you know good yeah 50 pounds for a bivy bag and a good sleeping bag you need a better sleeping bag i mean you need to add a season if you're using a three season bag in a tent then you'd need a four season bag in a bivy bag um i, I used to use i used to use um synthetic ones because i was doing sort of several nights in a row and the bivy bag steadily got damper and damper uh, but nowadays I use a, a a downfield one because I'm, you know, if my bivy bag gets damp the first night, I'm going to go to a luxury hotel where I can hang it up in the bathroom and dry it out again. So I'm, I'm no longer doing, you know, several nights in a row in bad weather. So a downfield one is much better. Well, I think that brings us to our first question, actually, um, which is you said that you now use a down sleeping bag. Um, has this ever caused you any problems with Scotland's damp weather? Um, no, because uh, a bivy bag is breathable. Um, I mean, as I said, I haven't tried using the downfield sleeping bag for several nights in a row in the rain. It's fine for one night in the rain. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 the answer to that one. Okay. Um, and then. Do you ever use a tarp in combination with your bivy bag? No. Does that defeat the point <laughs> to you? <laughs> um, what I like about the bivy bag is the simplicity of it. You can unroll it anywhere. It can't get blown away. Uh, you can't forget the pegs because it doesn't have any pegs. Um, and I mean, if you're on, where was it? I was on the Quantox and in the middle of the night there was a strange noise like someone snoring nearby and it was uh when i shone my torch it was two male roe deer two roebucks <laughs> confronting each other <laughs> about to have an antler fight so i just sort of picked up my bivy bag in the nearby woodland to avoid being trampled by um, roebucks which i mean it's not one of the main risks of being on a hilltop but it doesn't you know it's so easy to pick up and shift it's so simple so I've never gone for the tarp option. On the other hand, I'm shortly probably going to go on a hike with my son along the Arran coastal path. Uh, and it's there's not going to be any accommodation because it's all booked up for COVID. So we're going to take two bivy bags and a tarp tent um, because it only weighs about 12 ounces and he's going to carry it anyway because he's younger than me. Um, and you, you can then put it up and you can have two baby bags and put your heads in underneath it and 
Uh, I mean, I enjoy a bit of suffering myself, but I try not to inflict it on my family. So we're going to be, that will be my, actually my first time with a combination of the top tent and the baby bag. But that's how I'm planning to do that one. That sounds like a lovely trip as well. Oh, well, great to see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you mentioned... A, there is a superb cave halfway around that I got my eye on. The one where oh, Robert lovely. saw the spider. You know, he oh. was in a cave and there was the spider and the spider went yes. up nine times and he decided to carry on fighting the English. <laughs> and that's that cave? Well, that's that cave, but so were two other caves. One of them <laughs> Northern Ireland and one of them down here in Dumfries and Galloway. It's one of the fantastic. caves in which that happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, and you mentioned roe deer there, um, but what other encounters have you had with animals and perhaps insects? Um, have you ever woken up in the night feeling frightened in a bivvy bag? Uh, only once when it was a human being, and that was because I'd bivvied down in a field edge um, in the lowlands, and I just heard the unmistakable sound of a shotgun being cocked. <laughs> it was just somebody who was out shooting pheasants, and he came around the field <laughs> and he gave us a nice wave, and we gave him a wave back, and he went on on his way. Um, no, I mean, midges are obviously an issue, but I generally avoid them by going uphill. Mm -hmm. uh, the roebuck's the most frightening wildlife, I think. I was thinking about, I, I haven't done any bivvying abroad, really. I did, I, I bivvied in the Spanish Sierra Nevada, which was wonderful. But I was thinking, um, if you were bivvying in, in the America, you'd say one advantage, one difference between the bivy bag and the tent is that in the bivy bag, you can see the bear coming and in a tent, you can only hear the bear coming. <laughs> I don't know if that's a plus or a minus. I mean, yeah, I don't know about that one. <laughs> no, I did have a mouse, which was raiding my muesli bag, but that, that wasn't very threatening. I just hung the muesli bag on a twig. Um, slugs, it's not nice having a slug in bed. <laughs> Um, as a, a next question then, um, we've got a couple about the kind of practicalities of using the bivy bag. Um, so could you talk through the process of actually getting into the bag? Um, they're trying to picture how to avoid coating everything in mud uh, with boots and clothes. Well, you... Oh dear. Who, who asked this question? You don't have a name. You could well, keep... No. Um, <laughs> Uh, Gerald from Ipswich, you take your boots off before you get in. <laughs> you put the sleeping bag in the bivy bag, in bag and you usually put the mat inside the bivy bag as well. Okay. And you lay it on the ground with an opening, opening towards you like the mouth of a rose. <laughs> and then you loosen your boots and you step out of one boot into the entrance area and then you step out of the other boot into the entrance area and then you wriggle yourself down inwards like a shrimp retiring into its burrow at nightfall. I mean, if you've got the kind of uh, closed cell foam mat, that's really good because you can spread it out on the dewy grass and it will stay dry because it doesn't absorb water and you can do all your dressing and undressing on the foam mat. But normally, nowadays, I have an inflatable mat, which is you don't really want to stand on it. You just want to put it in the baby bag and lie down on top of it. But no, I don't generally bivy in deep mud. I generally choose somewhere else. I suppose so if your, your goes, boots are muddy already. Pads, really. Actually, yeah. yes, that's true. I have bivied in <laughs> a field with my cows, and that was a bit worrying. <laughs> um, and also, um, in inclement weather with just a bivy, how do you effectively operate a wet, dry clothes system without getting you, you or yourself, sorry, either yourself or your clothes wet while getting changed? Um, yeah, well, that's a tricky yeah. one. On the whole, I tend to avoid that situation. Like, you know, um, and there was a time when I was heading up to the summit of Skidor and I was walking along the summit ridge in the evening light. Well, it wasn't actually, it was the beginning of the night. It was dark. Um, and a serious rain shower came along and I immediately got into my bivy while my clothes underneath were still dry. But basically, you can get into a bivy and you can, I mean, I had to do a lot of fiddling around in that bivy because I got into the bivy bag and then I zipped it up and then I had to do everything inside the bivy bag. Um, but basically, you can do a lot wriggling around inside a bivy. Um, 
I mean, it would it wouldn't do any harm to take a course of yoga before <laughs> setting out for a trip like that. Um, yeah, I mean, on the whole, nowadays I avoid that situation, but you can change all your clothes, entire every garment you've got inside a baby bag. It's quite tricky. I mean, you can't see what you're doing. It's all writhing around. <laughs> you end up with your trousers on back to front or both legs down the same leg of the trousers. Uh, it's a good way of getting warm. And um, if if you're not bivying with um, a camping mat, what isolates you from the cold ground? Or would you say that you need to take one if it's going to be cold? Um, if it's going to be cold, if it's winter, yes, I would take a mat. Um, what insulates you from the cold ground? I mean, as I said, you spend 20 minutes finding the ideal, ideal site. And in summer, you can get enough insulation from heather or spongy old high tall grass. I'm just grabbing. Oh, um, hi, Ronald. Have you ever been caught out in lightning while well, bivying? Yeah, that night I was just talking about on the top of Skiddor. <laughs> I was zipped <laughs> up in my bivy bag with the rain pounding down on the outside of the bag and there was no way I was going to move. Um, I was about, I don't know, 200 metres down from the summit of Skiddor, just far enough down to get out of the wind because, you know, it was raining so hard. Um, I'd, um, yeah, I'd sort of hit the hill at about four o'clock in the afternoon when everybody was leaving. So I'd had a, a, a moderate day's walking over Great Cock Up. You know, I should have realised, shouldn't I? Start your day <laughs> on Great Cock Up. How's it going to end? Um, I wasn't going to move. Uh, and yes, and the, then the lightning started and it was quite exciting. Um, I persuaded myself that in a soaking wet bivy bag, if you're struck by lightning, there'll be a Faraday cage effect and the lightning will go down the outside of the bivy bag. And uh, yeah, I just fell asleep. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I could sleep through a lightning storm anyway. Well, you'd have That's to try. <laughs> I don't know if I could. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> it I mean, I don't think it was. It was just a very heavy shower. I don't think it was lightning all night. Um, I mean, possibly it, and there were only sort of three or four lightnings and they'd stopped and I went to sleep at that point. But. Mm -hmm. Um, and tips for dealing with condensation. Um, I've bivvied before and everything has stayed bone dry, but recently I bivvied on my local hill for the full moon and there was lots of condensation on the bag. Um, my sleeping bag became quite wet and I got quite cold. It was still glorious though, and I was wondering if you had any tips on keeping the sleeping bag dry in those conditions. Well, a good sleeping bag has a certain water repellent quality. I did study up, I consulted my. Um, half brother-in-law who works for the Met Office about dew and why it falls on some places and not on others and his explanation was really complicated because <laughs> uh, it's a really complicated subject sometimes I mean it, it is random sometimes the top of the hill is better than often the top of the hill is better than the bottom um, I mean, one thing is that you know the water should bead up and fall off your bivy bag and if it doesn't you treat it like a waterproof jacket I mean I put my very old baby bag i you know i did the proper thing with it i slashed you know i spent all that money on the special waterproofing wash-in waterproofer and detergent i mean it must have been at least a fiver um and i washed it in the washing machine and it's wonderful you can you know the water does beat up and fall off and that is a great help when it comes to getting the moisture out through the night obviously if the thing is soaking wet on the outside then vapor, the water vapor can't get out of it and the dampness that you get inside is the sort of half pint or so that you give off from your body during the night. So it has to get out. If there's a bit of a breeze, that certainly helps with the um, the, the waterproof, the, the breathable membrane, but which is why I try to, you know, to, to stay somewhere that's not entirely sheltered, but has a little air movement over the top of it. Also, I love the feeling of the air moving across my face as well, but that's part of it. And the other thing that matters is not to breathe into your bivy bag, because that's just a whole lot of extra moisture, which is going to end up in your sleeping bag. So even if it's raining really hard, I'll leave a tiny little hole at the side and do my breathing through that. Um, the disadvantage of that is that the zip of the slip, you know, the handle of the zip 
always dangles on your leg <laughs> when you do that. I haven't found the solution to that one yet. <laughs> always things to figure out. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. There's always more to learn. <laughs> Uh, and I know in your presentation, you did show us that photo of you uh, bivying in a wood. Um, but we had a question early on. Um, do you always bivy at high level? And if not, are there more things to consider if you're lower down? Um, I don't always bivy at high level. If the weather's nasty, I'm busy low down. I mean, I mean, that shot was actually in my back garden and I was just doing it as a demonstration <laughs> shot. But it would have been a very... No, actually, I have bivied in my back garden because I was testing somebody's bivy back. And that wood rush stuff is really comfortable to bivy on. Um, I mean, when you're at low level, you have to be a bit more circumspect and think about gamekeepers and that kind of thing. But basically, no, I'm just, just the same. I'm looking for a comfortable bed and shelter. Um, Less of a view, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, the reason I'm bivying low down is because it's not a particularly nice night, usually. Um, if it's a nice night, I'll be bivying as high as I can get for the view and the atmosphere and, yeah. But I don't think and there's any special technique for low level. Um, no, no, no. It's, I mean, it's generally... <laughs> Oh, I mean, yeah, you have to think about trees a bit. If they drip on you during the night, that can be quite disturbing uh, because the bivy bag's right beside your ear. So, you know, mm. if you've got a tree, which is putting a great bloop of water every five seconds, two inches from your ear, that can be a little bit upsetting. But the general thing is if you walk far enough, you're going to sleep. And have you ever had problems with ticks while bivying on grass or heather? Um, again, I haven't really because I sleep high. I had a horrible night with ticks with a tent once, but that was, you know, biffing at low level in long grass in the West Highlands. So I was asking for it. Um, I mean, I'm fairly blase about ticks. I just pull them off. I suppose it's finding your spot, isn't it? Um, well, it's another advantage of sleeping high. I mean, the midges are worse yeah. than the ticks. As a, as a predator of human beings in the hills, I think the midges are the worst. <laughs> With ticks and flies and horseflies a bit further down the biting order. Seeing what other questions we've got. Um, is it possible to pack too many cr custard creams? Oh, somebody has been reading the first edition of the book. Well, yeah, obviously <laughs> it's possible to have too many, but it's much easier <laughs> to have too few. Um, yeah, the first edition of the book was considerably more austere and it celebrated the miseries perhaps a little bit too much. I don't know. Can you have too much misery in your life? <laughs> it's that type two fun, isn't it? I, I, I keep <laughs> wanting to write these nice books about places like Rannoch Moor or, you know, the, the, uh, and I find that I really need to have a, a, some misery, you know, like the, the outdoor Outdoor books has now kind of moved into, it's been invaded by the misery memoir. <laughs> you can't sell a book unless you've got some reason for being miserable. Um, I suppose the thing... Sorry, the that's thing a bit for... diversion from the question, wasn't it? Custard, <laughs> yeah, he's referring... I mean, custard creams, my, my, my friend Glyn, who's far more austere than me, um, because he doesn't have any money, uh, he did work out that half a kilogram of custard creams has more calories than half a kilogram of specialized energy bars from a climbing shop and costs you about sort of 75p so he used to exist pretty well entirely on custard cream um uh yeah they're very they're, yes yeah they have they have a lot of calories for that and if you're if you're running you do want to keep the weight down and you're not bothered about what you eat so much because, you know, if you run far enough, you can eat anything. And I suppose the thing with, you know, you obviously enjoy the, well, the miserable nights out on the hill. Um, and I don't enjoy but, them. I don't, <laughs> I don't write experience. about them. They're much it's more fun experience. to write about. And um, <laughs> I think the thing is the possibility of misery makes the, the joy more intense. Hmm. You know, if you just think, you know, you take your tent to a campsite and you go to sleep and you have a hot shower and in the other way around, presumably. And then you get up in the morning and you put on your great big heavy rucksack and you plod another 15 miles. And 
I mean, you know, it's pleasant, it's enjoyable, but it's it's not going to leave burn marks in your memory forever afterwards. Whereas, you know, the night on top of that Monroe in Scotland, which was an absolutely magic night, um, part of the pleasure was that, you know, there could have been a, it could have snowed in the night, there could have been a, you know, a, a torrential rain. It was before the days when weather forecasts were as good as they are now. Um, I mean, it's certainly true that in a bivvy bag, the nasty nights are nastier, but it's also true that the nice nights are a lot nicer and the balance is definitely in the bivvy bag's favour. Yeah, I think the, the point I was going to make is that, you know, people can choose the bivvying experience that they want. And if you just want to go bivvying in the summer on those beautiful evenings, then you can just do that. Yeah, I mean, it's still going to be a little bit unsettling, not having anything between you and the sky. Um. Um, well, just before we wrap up this evening, um, I wanted to ask you about the best place that you've bivied or your most memorable experience, or perhaps they're two different things. Well, the most memorable is the nastiest. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was probably that night in, in Upper Eskdale, which you can read about in in the Cicerone 50 year anniversary book, which is a good book to buy, even apart from that <laughs> chapter about the bivy bag night in Upper Eskdale. And I made quite a few mistakes, which I shouldn't have done, considering how long I've been at it. Um, and then what would you say? Well, there have been, so been, so been, so been so many wonderful nights. Um, I mean, the Snowden one was had no unenjoyable aspects to it, whatever. It was just perfect all the way. It could hardly have been improved uh, unless somebody had come up in the morning selling ice creams or coffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I suppose. I mean, there is a restaurant there now. I think it was um, just a concrete shack at the time. Yeah, I mean, any bivy night would be improved by a, a waiter serving fresh coffee for breakfast. But leaving that aside, <laughs> mm, I don't know that, I mean, the, the most recent one, the, the one on Waller Crag, I mean, that that was a beautiful, a beautiful night out. Um, Cicerone Extra is going to have an article quite soon, which is free. You can read it for nothing on the website <laughs> about a night out on Helm Crag, which was pretty near perfect as well. Um, actually, it was grey and drizzly in the morning, but it was an amazing night out and a very cosy and warm. Um, I think it's lovely that you're actually struggling to think of one particular <laughs> night. <laughs> well, look, I, I, have, I have spent 100 <laughs> nights sleeping on summits, and there have also been some yeah. pretty nice nights on sea cliffs as well. So there's, you know, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, I mean, you know, what's what's been your most wonderful night out clubbing <laughs> or <laughs> your most beautiful day riding the bicycle? You know, there's a lot to choose from. And, and a lot of nice, well, I don't know, maybe you're not a clubber at all. <laughs> <laughs> not really at the moment. <laughs> so are there, are there any more, is there a really provocative question from a listener that you felt embarrassed mm -hmm. to ask? No, I think we've got through them all actually this evening. Oh. I can see. Oh, um, shame on you listeners. <laughs> Well, Ronald, thank you so much um, for joining me this evening and talking to me all about bivying. Um, it must be a, a beautiful night, actually, for going out today. Yeah. So I'm sorry that we've kept you in <laughs> if you were planning to go out. <laughs> yeah, well, there's still that nice uh, bivy site out in our woods, but it's a little bit eccentric to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our audience for sending in so many fantastic questions. Um, and yeah, for, for engaging. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful to chat to you, Ronald. And you must tell them the discount code. So they get yes, on £2.49 will... off. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll just pop it along the bottom again. Um, but if you would like to get 25% off Ronald's the Book of the Bivvy, um, you can use the discount code BIVVY25. Um, at the checkout on the Cicero website and yeah and also um, if you enjoyed the event and you'd like to send it to someone else and you'd like to recommend that they also watch it um, it will be available afterwards on the Cicero website 
on our YouTube channel and on Facebook. Um, so yes, this information and our lovely chat is, will be available um, yes, forevermore on the Cicero website. So, yes. Right, they could play it at my funeral. <laughs> still be there. <laughs> it will still be there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. So thank you, Ronald. Thanks very, thanks very much, Jamie. It's been a joy. <laughs>